is Messi. It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station. It's a very good evening, Zimbabwe. The hashtag remains the same. Bring back our football. And from time to time, you're going to hear us uh, refer to that hashtag because we certainly want our game back where it belongs, in our eyes, whether it's on TV or we are allowed into stadiums. We want to play our game. Bring back our football. That's the cry of everyone within the world of sport. And we hope that the administrators are going to share that view with us. The team is here for Wacky Wednesday. Mike Mike. My daughter, Chris Midzi. Tatenda Ziambi is handling all our digital platforms. Sean Tafirinika produced the, the show. And my name is Barry Manandi. On the home front today, we're talking cricket, where Zimbabwe have selected a youthful squad to face Afghanistan in two tests and three T20 international matches in Abu Dhabi. We'll hear the thoughts of the ZFM sport team on those selections and Zimbabwe cricket in general going forward. We'll take you around the world in 60, starting off down under where Russia's Daniel Medvedev beat compatriot Andrei Rublev to reach the semi-finals at the Australian Open for the first time. In England, Eddie Jones believes England's lack of aggression at the start of their Six Nations title defence may be the result of playing matches behind closed doors. And in South Africa, Proteus stalwart Faf Duplessis has decided to bring down the curtains on his test career. Well, the one place you won't get the hashtag bring back our football is in Europe where the action is in full <laughs> swing. And that is where we'll center in the beautiful game. The Champions League was back last night and French star Kylian Mbappe believes the best is still to come from PSG after his stunning hat-trick helped the French club to memorable 4-1 win over Barcelona at the Camp Nou. Elsewhere, Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp was pleased his players proved the doubters wrong and avoided a slip-up with the victory over RB Leipzig. There's action tonight. The reigning champions of Portugal and Italy go head to head at Estadio do Dragao with Porto hosting Juventus. In the other match tonight, Sevilla will take on Borussia Dortmund. We know it's Wacky Wednesday, but today is a little bit special because last night we received news, the sad news, uh, that Saul Musaka, that soldier love to Dar Zim Dance Hall fans had passed on. And uh, here on the show, we say rest in peace. Sauro Chibaba, Monoaste Mbeni, Jalav. Here's his track, Dini Uya Uya. Hi, you're listening to ZFM Sport. My name is Graham Sharp, and I'm the first Zimbabwean to take on the Dakar Rally in a bike. Z. Get in touch with us on at ZFM Sport. We're on every platform that you can think of, including YouTube. Now, YouTube is great because you can listen to back editions of the show and uh, fact check us if you like. And uh, if you think that we predicted things in one direction and actually did another direction, there's always proof online because they say the internet never forgets. In our individual capacities, it's at Mike Madoda, at Chris Midzi, at Tatenda Ziambi, at uh, Sean Tafirinika, and at Barry. Manandi at Gazaman 14 is Alois Bunjira if you want to get in touch with him. We're going to be talking about cricket and that selection of the Zimbabwe test team that's traveling and playing against uh, Afghanistan in Abu Dhabi. Uh, but first, a local sports news roundup. The Home Front, local sports news and analysis. Yo, local sports news roundup starts uh, with some good news uh, out of hockey where the Zimbabwe senior men and women hockey teams are through to the Africa Cup of Nations. The qualification is based on the current world rankings after the qualifying event was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Hockey Association of Zimbabwe Secretary General Sarah Bennett confirmed the development after receiving communication from Africa Hockey Federation. Zimbabwe is supposed to host the Central South Africa Regional Qualifier for the Africa Cup of Nations this month 
before it was moved to May. In basketball news, the Basketball Union of Zimbabwe has released the list of top 15 women's players of the last decade. The list was compiled after nominations by various coaches around the country. The association wants to honor the best players of the past decade in three categories, team of the decade, player of the decade and people's choice player of the decade we'll wrap it up with football news where zimbabwe champions fc platinum left the country yesterday for dakar senegal ahead of their CAF confederation cup playoff second leg against asc giraffe which will be played on sunday the match is a must win for the zimbabwean champions who lost the first leg one nil at the national sports stadium fc platinum coach nomen mapeza says he's confident his side will overturn the result Hi, my name is Sean Williams, Zimbabwe cricket captain. You're listening to ZFM Sport. Z. Well, as we said at the top of the show, we're talking about the Chevrons uh, today. Now, there was a squad announcement yesterday uh, of the team that will face Afghanistan in two tests and three T20 international matches in Abu Dhabi. It was a very youthful side that was announced by Zimbabwe Cricket, and we'll get the thoughts of the ZFM uh, sports team momentarily. Tarisai Musakanda, who had not played another test match uh, since he made his debut away to Sri Lanka in July 2017, he's bounced back uh, to reclaim his place in the national side following some impressive performances. Uh, the Chevrons are set to leave for Abu Dhabi via Dubai on Friday. The squad looks like this. Sean Williams will captain the side. Ryan Burl, Sikander Raza, but Register Kava, Kevin Kasuza, now Wesley Madevere, the exciting Wesley Madevere, uh, Wellington Masakadza, Prince Mashaure, Brandon Mavuta, Tarisai Masakanda, as we spoke about earlier, Richmond Mutumbami, Blessing Muzarabani, Richard Ngarava, uh, Victor Nyauchi, and Donald Tiripano. Now, earlier today, we caught up with former Zimbabwe Test player and cricket pundit Dirk Villuan, who said it's a positive thing that the squad selection points to giving youngsters game time. Uh, I think the reality is, if Zimbabwe cricket is going to be honest with itself and, and as a nation, is that the Test temp Championship is not something that we fight for. But it's an opportunity for us to continue playing test cricket and to use it as a as a stepping stone for a lot of youngsters. I would assume that Zimbabwe cricket need to be looking at the shorter version of the game where they can compete. Um, I know there's been a little bit of uh, news around that Zimbabwe cricket and a couple of the smaller nations are, are asking for some support for test cricket. And that shows you how difficult it is to compete against the big names. Um, have a look at the test series that's just ended in Bangladesh a West Indies side that was picked on the back of we'll call it their experienced players not wanting to tour for whatever reason whether it was bubble or tours coming up or whatever that might have been that they sent an extremely inexperienced side to the subcontinent and they came back winning two test matches and it just shows that it would have been very easy for West Indies to have cancelled that tour they've sent a very underbaked underexperienced young West Indies side to Bangladesh. History shows that many, many test nations have failed in Bangladesh. And to be fair, many have failed on the subcontinent. West Indies won two test matches in very um, historic scenarios of chasing massive scores to win in the first test match and then bowling a team out in the second one to win two test matches in a row. That is almost unheard of. And if Zimbabwe cricket can take from that in realizing that if we just back the youngsters, give them an opportunity, allow them to go and express themselves, that West Indies will prove that the younger or the the lesser nations can succeed at the highest level. But relying on players that we've used in and out uh, for many years and then calling disaster because those players aren't available uh, is probably the wrong way to go. If those that have been left out and the obvious ones, uh, without naming all of them, but Brian Taylor, Sean Irvin, uh, Carl Jarvis, had retired yesterday, we couldn't be crying foul. So the reality is that cricket is progressive. It carries on. But if you put your trust in young players, allow them to express themselves, you can achieve results. You might not achieve what West Indies did in a short space of time, but trust the process. Even if the results come back as a total disaster, trust the process and allow them to go and and, uh, build their experience in international cricket. See. 
the voice there of uh, Dirk Valu and talking about the positives that could potentially come out of selecting such a youthful squad. And a youthful it certainly is, Mike. Um, what are your thoughts on this uh, announcement? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Dirk Thoyun in terms of uh, the selectors uh, going youthful for this tour. Uh, Zimbabwe, of course, we should fancy our chances versus Afghanistan. Uh, and this is the perfect opportunity to blood in youngsters, but also uh, a perfect opportunity to reward informed players like Musa Kanda, who you have mentioned. He's been out in the wilderness uh, ever since he made his debut, but he's put in the hard yards, Barry. We saw cricket being played last year, the sterling work that was done by Zimbabwe to bring the game back uh, at a local level and that is where Tarisai Musakanda actually cashed in. Uh, he was named uh, I think the National Premier League batsman of the tournament uh, and uh, he also scored back-to-back uh, -back centuries recently for the Southern Select side in the four-day matches that were played. So he is a player that's bang on form and he has been rewarded for that form. The only way you can do that is if cricket is being played and that's what's happened in Zimbabwe over the last 12 months. So Zimbabwe cricket has laid the foundation. They've laid the groundwork for players like Musa Kanda to put their hands up, prove themselves and push for national selection and they've been rewarded. Absolutely. Now, when we talk about youthful, um, just to demonstrate the point, Chris, uh, you look at some of the ages of those players. Uh, Ryan Burl, one of the senior statesmen in the side because he's age 26. But you look at Wesley mm -hmm. Madevere, 20 years old. Blessing Mzarabani, 24. Brandon Mavuta, 23. Richard Ngarawa, 23. Wellington Masakadza, 27. Kevin Kasuza, 27. Um, you, at an average age of about, quick calculation, possibly 25, is certainly a marker to say Zimbabwe cricket is thinking of about the next generation more so than what we're doing now and it's, I think it's absolutely brilliant that that is their, um, the way they're thinking at the moment because what you then create is uh, continuity. So in as much as they're going to get run out now, they may not necessarily put up their best performances, but what it does is it gives them experience. And further along the line, these are the players that we're going to be relying um, in terms of our national cricket team. These are the, uh, I can call them kids for now. These are the kids we're going to be relying on um, a little bit further along. So it's brilliant that they've brought them in. And in terms of continuity, what this does is it also um, assists in terms of uh, dislodging that bottleneck where you always have the more senior players in a team that always get the run out and the younger players are not necessarily getting a chance so it also um, unclogs that bottleneck and you'll have people coming through the structures as well which I'm sure Zimbabwe cricket is definitely working on we actually need these players to put in some performances, Barry. Uh, that's the best way of uh, putting some pressure uh, on some of the senior players that are missing for this tour. Uh, you've got, of course, uh, Sean Williams, uh, Sikandar Razabut and Rezic to cover. I think uh, Donald Tripano, those are sort of like the senior players that have gone on tour. Uh, but the ones that are missing, Brendan Taylor is missing, Craig Irvine is missing. You've also got, of course... Um, uh, players like PJ Moore who are unavailable and the best way you can put pressure on those players is by putting in performances against nations like Afghanistan and also it then gives the selectors and those at Zimbabwe cricket uh, something to think about if you're worth considering when we are playing the tougher nations when we play your Indias when we play the West Indies when we play nations like that can you be considered because if you fail against Afghanistan then it'll be a difficult ask for the selectors to consider you for the tougher tests to come later on this year and next year. Mike is absolutely right, Chris, because when you look at it, um, the, the old adage says that there's no uh, substitute for time out in the middle. And in truth, if we want these guys to then carry the torch uh, going forward, uh, especially your uh, 23, 24 year olds, your Wesley Madaveri, who's 20, uh, in the next sort of three two to three years uh, when we expect them to be ripe and ready we have to give them time in the middle now and what better time than Af against Afghanistan so that when they do face the tougher uh, um, uh, tests they've already had time out in the middle and that pun was certainly intended <laughs> so it's, it's definitely true that they need to um to have the time in the middle so that they can get that experience, they can put up the great performances. Um, I think we saw it especially with Blessing Zarabani. Um, he put up some brilliant performances for the national team and that is as a result of simply being given that chance. And what did he do when he got the chance? He performed um, absolutely brilliantly and he then stands out. So going into another test like this, he, he's able to do the same. Your Brendan Mahutev, he's able to do the same. It bolsters the squad significantly and it also gives, when you, like Mike was talking 
talking about when you have a situation where these younger players are performing, your older players as well, it puts a bit of pressure on them. They want to perform better as well. You create competition and the quality of the cricket also gets significantly better. Well, it's the 17th of uh, uh, February and uh, already clearly the check, check from uh, uh, Zimbabwe Cricket has arrived for ZFM Sport because we're still being very complimentary about the effort <laughs> being made <laughs> by Zimbabwe Cricket. But in truth, they absolutely deserve it. Now, here's my question to you, Mike. The capacity to replicate this continuity, this generational shift, this ability to keep pushing through the talented players, the youngsters uh, through our various uh, uh, teams, whether it's for um, uh, for uh, test cricket or for white ball cricket. Um, the continuity must, must come out of possibly a national academy of sorts. Yes, we've got a great league program that's going on, but do we have enough structures in your view at the moment to be able to replicate this going forward? Listen, Barry, uh, right now, to be honest, you've got to say that uh, they are doing things on a step-by-step -step basis. Uh, and so one of the things that they've ticked off is making sure that they resuscitate club cricket, making sure that uh, they uh, sort of like fix the franchise system and get that moving and get regular cricket being played again. And then I'm sure they're going to transition into trying to consolidate on that position. And the consolidation Barry now comes in because you are now having more than just a short and medium term approach. You're now having a long term approach and a long term approach necessitates a national cricket academy. Now, they had one, which obviously went up in flames uh, in uh, Newland. <laughs> Literally. And, uh, uh, an eatery and, uh, <laughs> uh, and a gym. Uh, it, I think it's imperative that we are able to establish uh, an academy because if you take a look at some of our finest performers they have performed that way because they've either been groomed at here at a local academy here in Zimbabwe or they've gone abroad and been groomed there Henry Olonga case yeah. and point Heath sure. Streak those guys became world-class bowlers as a result of them being groomed in world-class academies and i think zimbabwe has got to establish a center that is able to work and fine-tune some of the youngsters that are coming out of the school's cricket setup so that they are being able uh, so that they are able or they're readied uh, for club cricket here in Zimbabwe, franchise cricket here in Zimbabwe, and then some of the more exceptional talents like the likes of Wesley Madeira, who I am really excited to see how he's going to transition from one day international and T20 international cricket to test cricket, because if he's able to make that transition, then Zimbabwe is going to uh, find themselves with a very uh, good player in the middle order. So I think you're so right, Barry, that... Um, the next stage has got to be the establishment of a national cricket academy but that can only happen i think if the icc restores that that funding that they pulled mm. from zimbabwe uh to help develop the game so zimbabwe cricket i think just this past week has appealed uh for that funding uh to be re-established for nations like zimbabwe for nations like afghanistan that will play a pivotal role if it is managed well because previously it wasn't managed well that's why it was pulled so if they manage to uh, manage this fund well if there's a level of accountability that is appreciable at the icc this is the fund that could give zimbabwe cricket that push they need in the next phase of their plans in resuscitating the game in zimbabwe no, absolutely and look in truth uh, the team led by Tavingom Kruhlani the chairman and of course uh, chief among them Hamilton Masakadza who is the director of cricket now at uh, Zimbabwe Cricket have done enough to, to, to put their hand up and say that our structures are pretty much uh, fit for purpose and we will manage funds uh, correctly, haven't they, Chris? And one leg that Mike talks about the step-by-step -step process uh, of developing and making sure the pipeline and the pathway uh, for players is clear has got to be also establishing a decent method of uh, the migration of players from the school system and being ripe from the school system uh, for club cricket. And now, Previously, in uh, in Mike and Mike's and I's generation, uh, uh, I know uh, I'm very a, long uh, time ago. A very long time <laughs> ago, dinosaurs were still walking the earth. Uh, the, the Zimbabwe cricket used to actually send coaches to schools, and those coaches might have been recently retired players, and that's that sort of uh, uh, humour. I think there's an opportunity there for us to actually refine players at the school system, so that they are being cons constantly uh, those diamonds are being developed as they go through that pathway. 
It's absolutely critical. Um, I think if you take a look at uh, the school system when it came to sports generally, that pipeline was very defined. It was very clear. You talked about those coaches going into the schools. Um, and also what would happen was that some of uh, your, your provincial and national team coaches would also go out to these schools to take a look at players and uh, actually see the crop that is coming out. And so when you have a system like that, by the time they get to finish the school level, you've already identified the gems that you would want to continue um, in the cricket system of the country. And when you have that, it's much easier to then direct if if this uh, particular player is going to be going into our local club setup, if they should go abroad um, so that they can become a more refined player. It's much easier to do that once you've got um, a tracking of your cricketers right down from primary school level. And Barry, I think uh, that's where Zimbabwe cricket and uh, arguably Zimbabwe rugby have missed the trick. Uh, I think part of the strategy is to get Zim certain schools playing sport again. So they should aim to get your plum trees playing cricket again, your mm. Miltons mm -hmm. playing competitively again, your Jamesons playing again, mm. your Thornhills, your Chaplins, your Chinoy High, your Maronderas. Those schools have fallen by the wayside. So it means that the pool of players at school level is smaller than it used to be in terms of quality. Those schools actually used to produce the odd germ here and there. Take a look, a look at uh, Pomi and Pumila Lombangwa. He's a product yeah. of Milton High School. When was the last time that Milton really put his hand up and uh, brought to the fore uh, a national talent? You take right. a look at the likes of Clive Chadani back then, uh, Ed Rainslet in, re uh, in recent times. He's, yeah. he's a Jameson boy. But if you mm. go to the field where cricket used to be played, Burnsfield at Jameson now, I think they're playing footy, they're playing everything else uh, other than cricket. So <laughs> that strategy from Zimbabwe cricket should be, let's just get back to resuscitating sport, getting kids at certain schools playing the sport again so that we can work on the numbers that are coming up through the school level. So the resounding sentiment of the ZFM sport team is that uh, inducting and ensuring that the youngsters are coming through and playing test, uh, test cricket, especially on this tour against Afghanistan in Abu Dhabi, is a clever move. It's a smart move. And we certainly back it. Now, there's more. You know what, Barry? Sorry, sorry. Just think of it. I mean, I want you to help me out here. Even sure. in Harare, surely, I mean, uh, how many schools have also fallen by the wayside in terms of mm. Ellis Robbins used to play cricket? I doubt Correct. they still do. No, they know they used to play cricket. I yep. doubt they they still do. Oreo used to play cricket. I doubt yep. they still do. You know, the likes of Alan Wilson, all those schools. Lord Malvin used yes. to play uh, cricket. Yes, Lord Malvin. Do. Lord Malvin was uh, used to play cricket, used to play rugby. I'm not sure yes. they, 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 they still do now. I think they only they, known they, for... They, they were not very good at it, but they played. No. <laughs> <laughs> but they played it nonetheless. The, the, the point being, I think, Mike, is that there was, there was a viable A-League of, 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 of schools and there was a viable B League of schools yes. and there was also some cross pollination because an A League school would be fixtured at least with one or two uh, B League schools in any sort of given given term uh, to ensure that there, that there was that uplift in, 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 in quality of yes, opposition be, be, so, be, because back then if you remember Barry we didn't have so much the uh, trust school league that is there yeah. now what we used to have were the provincial setup so we had Matebeleland so out in Matabeleland, Falcon was certainly going to play Milton at some point. Milton right. was going to play Christian Brothers College. They were going to play Plumtree. Uh, and then uh, I remember as Jameson, we were in what they called MCD, Mashonaland Country District. So we played Gandhi, we played Peterhouse, we played Watershed, Chinoy and Marondera. Those were the schools in our league. And then we'd also play the Harare School. So there was that right. cross-pollination between provinces. But you were guaranteed, no matter what level you were, that you were going to get action against one or two of the bigger boys. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is very important because the more you play uh, quality opposition, the better uh, that you become. So it's more good news coming out of Zimbabwe cricket youngsters being blooded in and that youth setup being revived, hopefully, in the near future. Your tour dates. Uh, the first test is scheduled for from the uh, 2nd to the 6th of March with the second five day match penciled in for the from the 10th to the 14th of March. The 10th is a very special date, very special, especially for ZFM Sport because it's my birthday. 
birthday. <laughs> the T20 international game. I, th- I think that's just a sneaky way of reminding us, Barry, just yes. in case we forgot. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad that you caught it clear, loud and clear. The T20 international games will be played on the 17th, the 19th and the 20th of March. Quick one, Mikey. Um center us and uh, make us manage expectations as we as we close this discussion against afghanistan do the results matter yes they do they do because this is a nation we we we, we should be able to beat uh, on any given day i know they've improved they've come along in leaps and bounds but if zimbabwe uh, is to say that they are making progress if we're to say that we're moving in the right direction then when we play nations like afghanistan when we play nations like nepal when we play nations like ireland against the dutch etc we've got to get results and by results i don't mean winning 2-1 or sharing a series we've <laughs> got to be able to put them away in both the test matches and the t20 international so I would be disappointed if we don't get a positive result out of this tour. Uh, that's great, and uh, that'll ensure that uh, Zimbabwe cricket puts pressure on these youngsters to perform as well. There's nothing worse than saying, uh, "Look, like we were in grade one. Everyone is a winner. Let's go out and play and enjoy. Yes, let's enjoy, <laughs> but let's get the results as well. We say to Zimbabwe cricket, well done. We're going in the right direction, and hopefully the Chevrons can deliver the results. Uh, we go around the world in 60. Next. Around the world in 60 seconds. International sports news. We take off down under where Russia's Daniel Medvedev beat compatriot Andrei Rublev to reach the semi-finals at the Australian Open for the first time. The fourth seed outlasted Rublev 7-5-6-3-6-2 as his eighth-ranked opponent struggled with the temperatures at Melbourne Park. In the ladies' draw, big serving Jennifer Brady staged a comeback victory of a fair fellow American Jessica Pegula to reach the semi-finals. The 22nd seed finished strongly with a 4-6, 6-2, 6-1 win on Rod Laver Arena and will now face Czech 25th seed Karolina Mutkova, who earlier stunned world number one Ashley Barty 1-6, 6-3, 6-2. We'll head over to England where Eddie Jones believes England's lack of aggression at the start of their Six Nations title defence may be the result of playing matches behind closed doors. England launched the 2021 edition with a lacklustre 11 7 6 loss to Scotland, and despite not being at their best, England ran in seven tries to beat visitors Italy 41 18 last weekend. Both matches were played without spectators because of coronavirus restrictions, a situation that is set to continue when England travel to Cardiff for a third round clash with the contenders Wales on Saturday. And we'll touch down in South Africa where Proteus stalwart Faf Duplessis has decided to bring down the curtains on his test career. The 36 year old made the announcement earlier today, a few days after Australia's tour of South Africa was shelved because of the ongoing COVID-19 situation in South Africa. In a post on his official Instagram account, Duplessis confirmed his decision and said, my heart is clear and the time is right to walk into a new chapter. Duplessis turned heads in his very first test appearance for South Africa with a match-saving fourth inning century in Adelaide back in 2012 and went on to represent the country in 69 games. Hi, my name is Ovidi Karuru, Zimbabwean player. You yeah, are listening to ZFM Sport. Z. The big leagues. The big teams. The big players. The beautiful game on ZFM Sport. The Champions League returned last night with a big game at the Camp Nou where PSG beat Barcelona 4-1, running out convincing winners at the Camp Nou. Kylian Mbappe scoring a stunning hat-trick. The win secured despite PSG being without the injured Neymar and Angel Di Maria. And despite Barcelona taking a first-half lead through a Lionel Messi penalty, PSG manager Mauricio Pochettino says that Mbappe promised him they'd win against Barcelona. Let's hear from him. Mbappe felt confident before this match. I say this because even in the training session before the game, he asked me, how many times have you won at the Camp Nou? I said once with Espanyol. So he replied, tomorrow you will win for the second time. Now, after the game, he came to me and told me, I told you, you have won for the second time. That 
is why he is a top player. Z. All the headlines, understandably, about Kylian Mbappe. He is just the second visiting player to score a hat-trick against Barca in a Champions League match at the Camp Nou after Andriy Shevchenko scored one for Dinamo Kiev way back in 1997. What a performance from the French star, Barry. Absolutely, and uh, in truth, it's not necessarily that he scored three goals uh, that uh, uh, warrants him to be man of the match. I think that he was absolutely uncontainable, unplayable throughout the game. And in truth, he he ran rings down that uh, left channel of uh, PSG's and gave the right def uh, defensive channel of um, Barcelona uh, some sleepless nights. And uh, uh, Serginho Dest, who who has been a, a decent player, has uh, shown that he has some ability. Was shown up quite uh, roughly last uh, last night by uh, Kylian Mbappe. I think the, the golfing class came out quite quite uh, reasonably. Was Mbappe's uh, job made easier, Barry, by the fact that uh, you mentioned Sejino Dest. He hasn't been getting a lot of game time recently. And then he was partnered on that right side of defense with Gerard Pique, who, has had a, who hasn't had a kick of football in three to four months. Did that make his yeah. job easier? I, th I think perhaps uh, Kuman might have been a little bit um, naive, um, or perhaps he, he he thought a little more of his players than than he ought to have. I think he should have been a little more cautious, like you quite rightly point out. There wasn't much playing time. There wasn't much enough legs on that side of Barcelona's defence. And in truth, when you're facing a motorbike, an absolute player who can shift at the rate that um, Mbappe can shift, you need your fittest players. You need your players that are going to be able to keep up with him. Uh, both were unable to last night. Uh, talking about Koeman, uh, Chris, he's come out and uh, paid tribute to Kylian Mbappe as anyone would after they score a hat trick. <laughs> you, you've got to, you've got to <laughs> doff your cap to him. Uh, he, he's described PSG as a more complete team, and I think it showed. I think it definitely showed um, in, in the way that PSG played in terms of the intensity with which they played. Um, you could see distinctly that PSG was the better team first half and that second half, even more in the second half. And it was quite distinct, um, especially with players like Kylian Mbappe, who were showing up consistently throughout that game. So that's the only thing uh, that you'd be able to do is to doff your cap uh, to Kylian Mbappe in that moment. And one of the reasons, Barry, I believe that they played with more intensity is that they have got the better athletes. They were more powerful and they were a lot faster than Barcelona. You take a look at Barcelona players. I mean, very good technically. On the ball, they are very good, uh, very comfortable, but they don't have the power. They don't have the pace that is needed in these big European games. So players like Sergio Busquets, when they are on the ball, they look great. But without the ball, it becomes a liability. And we saw that throughout the game. Pique again, when in possession at the back, very good player. When put under pressure and when he's forced into the wide areas and forced to actually defend, his defending is called into question. And I think that's the difference now because when you've got players who are sound technically or very good technically, they've got to be very, very good. And so Barcelona's players at the moment, this generation is good, but not exceptional. They got away with it in the past because they had exceptional players. Xavi Hernandez, Dani Alves, Iniesta, players like Neymar, like Suarez, who were not athletes, but were very, very good on the ball. Absolutely. And uh, firstly, I'm going to agree with you uh, that uh, I think that in the power stakes and in, in the in the ability to 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 uh, to have um, that extra edge, uh, as it were, that uh, PSG demonstrated last night. I think Paris Saint-Germain uh, was was far and above uh, Barcelona. Barcelona looked like the, the soft touch. The reason why I'm smiling is because um, what have we accused Paris Saint-Germain of uh, in previous seasons? We've accused them of being a soft touch, of being a coming, coming out of a farmer's league. They don't have the legs. They don't have the power. They don't have, they haven't been refined enough to be able to compete at this level. So I would like to compliment Mauricio Pochettino with what he's done with this team, with that ability to be as hungry as they looked last night, especially in the midfield battles. You could see that they were hungry for the football. Definitely hungry for the football. So Barcelona will have it all to do when they go to Paris. Can they restore their dignity and make it an honorable exit or will they be put to the sword? Well, they've got three weeks to get their house in order. Hi, I'm Varios Coach Zdravko Logarusic and you are listening to ZFM Sport.
Sports with a difference. Continuing our Champions League review, the other match last night, Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp was pleased his players proved the doubters wrong and avoided a slip-up with their victory over RB Leipzig. Klopp's side broke a run of three straight defeats and put one foot in the last eight of the Champions League with a 2-0 win over the German side in Budapest. And in truth, Chris, when you are down on confidence, when you're down on your luck, all you need is the rub of the green. It was two goals and in truth, Liverpool was the better side last night, deserved to win. But those two goals came up as a result of slip-ups, in inverted commas, by RB Leipzig. But you have to take advantage and that shows that perhaps your luck is changing. It shows that perhaps your luck is changing, especially when you're able to capitalize on those mistakes that the opposition is making. RB Leipzig made those mistakes and Liverpool was able to capitalize. And being able to do that, you're playing away from home and essentially you need this win. You absolutely need this win for your confidence and you manage to get the win. I think this was brilliant um, from Liverpool last night. Not necessarily the most exciting match in the first half, but they managed to get that result. Yeah, and indeed uh, created enough chances to to win the match. What's more important for you, Mike, uh, the the two or the zero? Ah, the zero for me, Barry. Uh, that would have done, uh, I think, uh, the confidence of the defence uh, a world of good. Uh, Alisson certainly needed it uh, after his uh, performances in the last couple of matches uh, where he's had a, a, a few howlers uh, versus City and uh, Leicester. Uh, managed to keep a, a clean sheet. I think it would have been something that's welcome for him. Just uh, giving those defenders uh, a bit of confidence. And I was particularly impressed by the performance of um, Ozan Kabak, who was named mm. man of the match. What a performance uh, from the Turk. I think showing why Jurgen Klopp signed him. Very, very comfortable on the ball. Very strong in the air. Reads the game very well uh, and was able to dominate a very good Leipzig attack. Let's not forget that this is a Leipzig that knocked Manchester United out of the Champions League. Uh, A Leipzig that's put... um, some of the best sides in Europe to the sword and that got to the semi-finals of uh, the Champions League last season and Liverpool ran out comfortable winners in this game away from home so Liverpool will take this result they'll look to get the job done and who knows where things will end up because the luck of the draw the rub of the green here and there and uh, you could go deep in this competition you certainly could. It is, after all, a cup competition. And uh, the distraction is sorely needed uh, to return the co- the confidence of the Reds. In truth, going into a Merseyside derby this weekend in the league, that's what you sort of need. You need to mm-hmm. get that confidence back that you can win matches, you can get clean sheets, you can play the best and play at your best. Yeah, I think that the difficulty when a team... Um, is psychologically down is that it's one of the most difficult things to change because there's a, it's it's different from when uh, there are things tactically that you need to change. There are players who need to improve. It's totally different when the entire team needs a psychological shift. And the only way to create that shift is to get these wins, whether they're domestic or international. Um, in the Champions League, you need to get the wins, and that's what Liverpool's managed to do. So sh- hopefully, it's going to give them that lift. They say losing is a habit, winning is a habit as well. Michael, you confident for Liverpool going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, Liverpool is, of all uh, English Premier League sides, uh, they are the side that's uh, most comfortable in Europe. Uh, And I think our trophy hall uh, in the Champions League, I think is testament to the fact that um, Liverpool has won as many Champions Leagues as uh, Manchester United in Manchester United's dominant era. Uh, I think United won two Champions Leagues, uh, 1999 uh, and 2008. And yet Liverpool was able to add two in that era uh, in 2005. And of course, uh, the title that they won in 2019. So this is a playing field where Liverpool is most comfortable in. uh, And because it's a cup competition, it's one in which I fancy Liverpool will do well. Remember, it always comes down to the luck of the draw. You know, sometimes you might get Bayern Munich in the quarterfinals. Another team might get Porto. Yeah. You know, uh, you might get Juventus in the quarterfinal. Another team Wouldn't might get, <laughs> yeah, might get uh, Sevilla. So it just comes down to that. If things go your way uh, in a Champions League tie, you could actually go deep in this competition. So uh, I wouldn't say never, uh, but I don't think Liverpool right now, with the state of their confidence, would be considered perhaps favourites for this tournament. I think Man City, for me, are looking like the best side in Europe. Uh, I was impressed by PSG last night and that performance. And I think Bayern Munich will always be there, thereabouts. So I can count at least maybe three or four sides that I would say have probably got a better chance than Liverpool of winning this tournament. That's the punditry. And uh, what we can't deny 
is that Liverpool won last night. 2-0 in the first leg. They go to a second leg, at least with a bit of confidence. Hi, my name is Rudy Nishamba. My tour is Super Striker. You're listening to ZFM Sports. Champions League action continues tonight and it's going to be Cristiano Ronaldo who's going to be playing in his native Portugal for Juventus for the first time tonight and coach Andrea Perlo is expecting something special from the five-time Ballon d'Or winner. Juventus meet Porto in the Champions League last 16 with the old lady determined to improve upon last year's continental exit at the stage to Lyon. Mike, just on Cristiano Ronaldo, he was brought in to win the Champions League. That goal is very clear because Juventus has enjoyed title after title title domestically from what you've seen so far during his time uh, with Juventus in the Champions League can he do the job he was brought in to do well time is running out if he's to do the job because uh, Juventus has fallen short uh, ever since uh, Cristiano Ronaldo uh, joined the old lady uh, remember they actually got to a final before he joined uh, thing uh, he joined the old lady, uh, losing out to uh, Real Madrid in that final that was played in Cardiff. Uh, and so there is a bit of pressure uh, as far as Ronaldo is concerned to lead Juventus uh, to uh, glory in Europe because people can't talk about Ronaldo inspiring Juventus to win the Scudetto because like you said, Juventus had been winning titles way before Ronaldo got there. And in fact, they'd actually been winning those titles more convincingly than they are now. Barry, uh, you take a look at the Juventus players who are not going to be travelling to Portugal. Paulo Dybala, Aaron Ramsey among them. They're likely to miss that trip. Is this a significant dent for them in terms of what this performance could look like? They desperately need to get a win here if they continue to continue their Champions League uh, aspirations. Yeah, it's uh, look, the, they're going to have to make do with whatever they have. And if you think about it, Porto are tricky, tricky customers, but in truth, um, it could be even a, a Juventus B-side on the basis of the resources and riches that Juventus should have in its playing staff uh, could be able to do the business. What they have to get over is that psychological hurdle of uh, uh, not playing the occasion necessarily, but playing the fact that we're a better football team, we can beat these guys and do the job. So those absentees, if you include the likes of our two, uh, should be a byline more so than the main story. The tragedy is that uh, the, the first part of uh, the Andrea Perlo uh, um, uh, experiment, in inverted commas, if uh, I want to borrow from your statement, uh, Chris, uh, it w- was a bit patchy. So people might still have that that uh, memory, that muscle memory to say that oh, this Juventus side hasn't, hasn't found its way, but it's a Juventus side that has. So I foresee these absentees not being a factor against Porto, but going forward in the competition might get a bit harder, especially in the quarterfinals, where now you're facing the best of the best. If they get the the rub of the green, the luck of the draw, they might be able to go deep, but I'm not sure that Ronaldo has had the impact that he needs to have for them to carry the day in the Champions League. And speaking of absentees, Porto themselves have several absentees to deal with in terms of their fullbacks, Nanu and Zaidu, also having a significant time on the sidelines recently. So Barry, Porto themselves are also having problems in terms of absentees through injury to deal with. Um, Nanu, Zaidu, Sanusi have both spent time on the sidelines recently. This is not necessarily the best thing for them in as much as they do have a pretty decent um, home streak in terms of defending at home. They're yet to concede a goal in the Champions League this season. It's also troubling for them that they don't have several uh, key members. Yeah, it's, and uh, look, even ultimately, if they if they were available, they haven't had much game time. So when you got players with that much rust, it's always going to be a tough one. Um, their home record is going to be a, a source of encouragement for them. But I think uh, we need to look at it in the manner that it ought to be, whereby this is just one leg of a tie. So you've got to perform in both legs. Uh, so even if they have a good game at home, uh, that good game is going to have to be brilliant because when they go back to Turin, you've got to think to yourself, uh, the odds are stacked. In, in Juventus's favour. So I'm thinking, yes, exciting game tonight. It, it should be very competitive. Uh, but ultimately, in this tie, you've got to favour the, the, the girlfriend of Italy, as they call Juventus. <laughs> La Fidenzata d'Italia, the girlfriend of Italy. That match is on tonight. But also on tonight, there's some action in Spain. Sevilla take on Borussia Dortmund in the first leg of their Champions League last 16. Knockout tie at Ramon Sanchez Pichuan Stadium. 
Well, surprise, surprise, there's also league action in England tonight. Some catch-up matches uh, involving Burnley and Manchester City. Burnley will be entertaining Fulham, whilst Everton will be taking on Manchester City. Now, Everton striker Dominic Calvert-Lewin will be absent once again for the Toffees versus Manchester City. Barry's just thrown his hands up in the air, obviously disgusted, because I fancy this has got... uh, some bearing on your fantasy picks. <laughs> I I just have to verify and check if I kept him in my fantasy team. But yeah, no, my fantasy is being affected quite horribly. No, no, no. I sold him, so I'm fine. <laughs> well, Barry, you might have dodged the bullet completely because uh, further bad news, Ilkay yeah. Gundogan is actually missing for Manchester City. If he was your captain, Shucks. you're stuffed. Was he? He was. He was. Yeah, that's a disaster. (laughs) But he had a great game last time. Look, I'm not going to be greedy, so I'll take that one. Uh, Gundogan certainly had been playing very well in the Premier League over the last couple of months. Definitely the form player in the league, putting his hand up to be named the best player in the Premier League. Now, this is the sort of game, Chris, that uh, the chasing pack, uh, Leicester, Manchester United, they would have been hoping that uh, perhaps Everton can do them a favor uh, and force City to drop some points. But without Dominic Calvert-Lewin, the task is made doubly difficult, especially with City showing the form that they have been exhibiting. It's going to be a little bit tougher for Everton without Calvert-Lewin. We know him for scoring goals and you have to score goals in these matches, especially if you're playing against a team like Manchester City. So it's, it's made doubly difficult, but Manchester City will probably close this one out. I close this one out. Sergio Aguero is back. Uh, he was not involved when they played against Spurs. He was an unused substitute. And uh, more good news for City fans, the few of you. Uh, Kevin De Bruyne is back <laughs> in training. Uh, and so it means that City are going to get stronger and stronger in the next few weeks. In Spain, one match. Uh, the Title hopefuls Atletico Madrid visit Levante to play one of their games in hand and they'll be looking to get all three points to heap more and more pressure on chasing Real Madrid and Barcelona. Ah, professionally done, Michael. Said like the true pundit that you are. You call them title hopefuls and not champions in waiting because you feel there's a lot of water to pass under the bridge in Spain and it might well change at the top of the La Liga table. Well, if it will, just tune into ZFM Stereo, ZFM Sports, and we'll let you know whether it actually does because this is your home for your up it's out of La Liga and the leagues in Europe as well as all sport. Tomorrow is our shortened show. Remember, we're doing our five-part series. It's part four. And we're looking at the World Cup in 2010. The African World Cup, first and only. That one should be absolutely amazing. So don't miss it. Five after six tomorrow. May God richly bless you. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Manande, out. <laughs>